a religious mystery worthy of the Da Vinci Code. Is it possible that Christianity evolved from an ancient Egyptian cult? In fact, is it also possible that the historical Jesus didn't really exist? The tale of a controversial theory and a fascinating journey into antiquity, based on the best-selling book by an Anglican priest, The Pagan Christ. I'm Anne-Marie MacDonald, and this is Doc Zone. Roughly one-third of the planet shares the same belief, that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was born on Christmas Day, died on a cross, and was resurrected by the power of God. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy. The story of Jesus Christ gives meaning to most Christians. It is the very glue that binds their faith and guides their actions. I warn to you, he is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. But one man, who has devoted his entire life to Christianity, has concluded that there is absolutely no evidence an historical Jesus ever lived. Christ is born today. Christianity made a rather fateful error in the early centuries of its life in which it took the message which it had and literalized it. Where and how the whole thing actually crystallized and took shape into what we now know as Christianity is still veiled in, in a mist. A dark mystery locked away for millennia in the strange code of an ancient stone. Its secrets contain the discovery of a new story of Jesus, one written 3,000 years before his birth. Ordinary people suspect that there's a lot more there to, to be told that they haven't been told. And the truth is that there was cover-up. A cover-up Tom Harper believes was designed to protect the Christian church and to mask the true identity of Jesus. In the town of Bethlehem, a narrow passage burrows deep into a wall of stone. It leads to one of the most sacred places on earth. Christians have come here, as they have for centuries, to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. The story started when Jesus was born here in, in, in an inn, grotto, stable, inside inn. The first Christians observed this place by building inside it a place for prayer. Now we're going to visit the grotto of the Nativity, where Jesus was born. It's a story now 2,000 years old. A story that begins with a virgin birth in this cave on December 25th. A divine birth heralded by a star in the sky. According to Christian tradition, this is the exact location where the Son of God was born. And for Christians the world over, it's also the place where their faith begins. 
but it's also the center of an ongoing controversy, a flashpoint for those who question the very earthly existence of Jesus. It may have a history, but is it historical? I'd never asked that question before. Tom Harper has been an ordained Anglican priest for more than 40 years. He's also a professor of New Testament and Greek studies, a Rhodes Scholar, and a best-selling author. All his life, he's believed explicitly in the Christ of the Gospels. Yes, I didn't question the miracles very much. I mean, the thought that there never was a historical Jesus never even rose to the surface of my, of my mind. You just simply assumed it dropped from the heavens, as it were. And there it was. But now, Tom Harper often finds himself at odds with other Christians in his approach to the faith. It's amazing, but at the heart of every religion, the same truth seems to be hitting me, that the spark of the divine is in every one of us before we meet Jesus or before we meet the Buddha or anyone else. It is implanted in the human consciousness and is the means whereby we ultimately know God and come to be like God. But for most Christians, the connection to God is made directly through the historical figure of Jesus Christ. What happened here in Jerusalem that only happened once and happened nowhere else on the face of the earth? Yes, exactly. Jesus was crucified, buried, and resurrected here. So that's the important thing. However... At the Holy Land Experience, a Christian theme park, preachers use theater to teach those seeking more insight into the life of Jesus. So it's just me and you. One of those bringing the story of Jesus to life is Christian actor Les Shevoldayoff. The king of the Jews, huh? Well... Oh, yeah, get up! Get up! People are hurting. And I think a lot of people come here saying, maybe, just maybe, I can catch a glimpse that God loves me. Because they've heard it. We've all heard it. But have you experienced it? And so we can bring that here. We can provide the environment where we can freely say the word of God. Get up. Get up. What's the matter with you? The mighty king of the Jews. Every story brought to life at the Holy Land experience comes word for word from the pages of the four Gospels that form the New Testament. The central character is Jesus Christ, whose life on earth is cut short by a brutal crucifixion. Christ figure is the part, the Messiah, who came to die on the cross, rose from the dead, and provide a way to heaven that you don't have to do anything other than accept. And people don't get it. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus Christ has actually become an idol in, 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 in the Christian religion. He is the focus of everything. They don't talk about God much, they talk, it's all about Jesus. And uh, surprisingly, because if you read the Gospels, he didn't talk that much about him, him himself. He pointed people to, to God. In his search for a better understanding of his faith and the life of Jesus Christ, Tom Harper closely studied the four stories of the Gospels, but he found little evidence to support the existence of a man said to have walked the earth some 2,000 years ago. There was so little, that is to say none, uh, in the sense of biographical information in these so-called biographies. They're contradictory. Uh, the, the nativity story in Matthew contradicts the sto nativity story in Luke, but the contradictions are everywhere. Tom Harper is not alone. Timothy Frake and Peter Gandy, authors of six books on Christianity, also challenge the idea of an historical Jesus. The Gospels are faith documents. They're not history documents. And I think in academic circles, this has been established for a very, very long time. They're faith documents. So put them on one side. You can't use them to, to, to ground the history of Jesus. There are no divine interventions in history. There is a common sense approach to things. And the traditional history is just inadequate, I'm afraid.
On the shores of the Sea of Galilee, Christian tourists gather at the place reputed to be the house where Jesus Christ preached to his first four disciples. Tour guide David Ridron makes his living recounting the story of the historical Jesus Christ. It was here along the shores of this lake where 2,000 years ago a Galilean teacher called Yoshua from a nearby town called Nazareth began its ministry and changed the world. Yet no physical evidence has ever been found to support the existence of Yoshua, or Jesus of Nazareth. Nor is there any confirmed written evidence of the existence of Jesus Christ during that time. We don't have, unfortunately, an historical Jesus because we have no mention of a man called Yoshua written about and described while Jesus was alive. The historical details we gain from the Bible just by reading between the lines. There are only 24 lines in the ancient text that come before the year 150 that refer to Jesus in any way. Most of them are ambiguous. Is this a basis on which to build a major world religion? With such scant evidence, a few lines of historical text, Harper began to question the very existence of Jesus Christ. Then he came across three 19th and 20th century scholars whose writings suggest that Christ was not born in a manger in Bethlehem, but on the sands of ancient Egypt. This mysterious and complex culture only began to reveal its secrets in modern times. Two hundred years ago, a soldier in Napoleon's army made a startling discovery when he unearthed the Rosetta Stone at an excavation site near the Nile River. This discovery would shake the very bedrock of Christianity. When they found this stone, they realized it was going to be of importance very quickly because they saw that on the stone there were three scripts. Egyptian hieroglyphs on the top, another script that they weren't too sure about in the middle, and then Greek at the bottom. This stone containing a decree written three times in Greek, ancient Egyptian demotic, and hieroglyphs provided the key to the mysterious markings that cover the statues, monuments, and papyri of ancient Egypt and opened up 3,000 years of that country's history and culture. The stone was used to study the extensive Egyptian records housed in the British Museum. And it uncovered a fascinating and familiar story, the story of Jesus. The calming of the sea, the walking on the water, the making the lame to walk and the deaf to hear, the raising the dead, the judging of the dead, the descent into hell, it went on and on. The basic archetype of the Annunciation at the birth of Jesus in the Nativity stories by the angel Gabriel. You take a crucial verse like, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Suddenly I see these say sayings and I'm told that they come from the, from the hieroglyphics of ancient Egypt. That's a pretty big shock, yes. Harper considered, was the story of Jesus Christ in fact based on that of a pagan god? Ancient Egypt, home to one of the world's oldest religions that parallels what Christians call paganism. It was a faith that related to the cycles of nature. The essence of life, birth, death, and resurrection was often represented by the sun. To worship the sun, the most powerful force of nature, meant to worship God. The ancient pagan world wasn't some sort of benighted, savage place. It wasn't primitive. It, it was the, a very advanced culture, which gave us philosophy, architecture, democracy, mathematics, science. And it had a highly evolved spirituality. And at the center of that spirituality were what was known as mystery cults. Thank you. 
At the heart of these cults were mysterious sun gods, half god, half man-like figures. Stories about them were written in hieroglyphs on the walls of the pharaoh's temples. And at the center of the mystery cults was a myth. And the myth is about a dying and resurrecting god-man, or son of god. And if you look at the story, you see that this god-man is born of a virgin and god, sometimes on the 25th of December. He changes water into wine at a wedding. He performs other miracles. He has 12 disciples. He teaches a doctrine of love. He upsets the status quo, the religious authorities. He's put to death at Easter, sometimes through crucifixion. If you look at the cover of our book, there's a picture of a figure that looks like Jesus, but it's not. It's this pagan dying and resurrecting God-man. And then, of course, he comes back from the dead. And if you want to commune with the God-man, you take bread and wine, symbolizing his body and blood. But that's not Christianity. This is paganism pre-Christian. So we are inside this temple. We call it the bear's house or the bear's room. So here and in front of us, some scenes showing In the temple of Luxor, ancient hieroglyphs describe a mythical mystery tale about a divine conception, or what Tom Harper claims to be a virgin birth, where a mother delivers a child in a cave, and three sages come to visit the infant deity. It's remarkably similar to the story told at the Church of Nativity, except this one predates it by almost 2,000 years. Standing in one of the panels is the sun god, Horus. This very important uh, god, because also this god had the same uh, birth or the same house. In the texts associated with the image of Horus, Harper found references to the Good Shepherd, the Lamb of God, and the Son of Man, all well-known biblical references to Jesus Christ. And also in the same time, his uncle. He claims 180 similarities between Horus and Jesus Christ. Horus is referred to as the Christos, or Ayusa. His virgin mother is the goddess Isis. When she got uh, this baby, Horus, she carrying him like in the same attitude, like the Virgin Mary and the Christ. The images of Mary and the images of Isis with Horus on her knee changeable. And in some churches today in Europe, they have a grotto in the bottom of the basement of the church where you will find a black Madonna. And the black Madonna is Isis and Horus. Horus is just one of many such gods. Harper found evidence of dozens of others. Some of them can be found in the Christian shrine at the Coptic Museum in Cairo. And they all have similar careers. They all have supernatural birth. They all are persecuted. That was an allegory or a symbol for the fact that each one of us, when we're born, we have the spark, the gift, and it's threatened that it'll be covered over by materialism, by uh, animal passions, by whatever. Next door to the Coptic Museum is one of the oldest churches in Egypt, St. Mark's. This church commemorates the journey said to have been taken by the Holy Family, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, when they fled persecution in Israel. What you're relating to is God or the universe or the mystery of life via this particular figure. It's about understanding the wisdom that the story embodies of death and spiritual resurrection and experiencing it for yourself so that you discover the Christ within you. St. Mark's Church was built during the earliest days of Christianity. It was a time when Christians were deeply divided in their beliefs. One of the factions was a mystical sect known as the Gnostics. And unlike other Christians who believed in a flesh and blood Jesus Christ, the Gnostics believed Jesus, or Joshua as they knew him, was like a pagan mystical god. You know, there was a major battle for the soul of Christianity in this period. 
and the Gnostics lost, and the literalists won. All through history, it has been the winners in any battle or any struggle that get to write the story and get to write how it happened. Joshua, as it would have been, Jesus is just the Greek name, the Joshua cult probably goes back 200 years at least before the time that we think of as Jesus being born. And so to really understand the nature of Gnostic mythology, you have to completely get away from the idea there's just the story we have in the New Testament. The Gnostic Gospels, of which we now have a large number, said you had to write your own Gospel to show you were initiated. So you can imagine how many there must have been. And so there's this whole, this, the whole cycle of myths. We have Christian commentators saying, yeah, all those stories of the pagan god, and they're admitting, you know, you're, you're, you have stories of, of, a, of the god-man riding a donkey. You have stories of the god-man dying and resurrecting. But yours are just stories, as really happened. Where and how? The whole thing actually crystallized and took shape into what we now know as Christianity is, is still veiled in, in a mist. It's, it's uh, becoming clearer, and I think ordinary people suspect that there's a lot more there to, to be told that they haven't been told. And, and, and the truth is that that's right, that there was cover-up, there was persecution of those who disagreed. According to Tom Harper, the church would preside over the largest and bloodiest cover-up in history. This is a Roman road, the Via Sacra, the Holy Road. Via Sacra, the sacred road, is the main street of ancient Rome and leads through some of its most important pagan holy sites. And at the beginning of the fourth century, under the newly crowned Emperor Constantine, it was a place of great chaos. The entire Western Roman Empire was in a state of collapse. Constantine had to battle five other emperors from the various parts of the empire who were all trying to make a play for the throne. So the idea of you know, let's have, let's all sing from the same hymn sheet became a really important and urgent matter for people. The Roman Empire was disintegrating. The barbarians were on the borders. In trying to unify his empire, Constantine was plagued by the fact that there were virtually dozens of religious cults to choose from. Christianity was against the law, and anyone practicing it was persecuted and killed. The most celebrated reminder of this persecution is the Roman Colosseum. But Tom Harper began to see a different side to this persecution. The Christians were persecuted somewhat at first. Not as much as they have claimed, by the way, but they were persecuted. But after the persecuting phase was over, they became the persecutors. And they became very vicious in their persecution of roasting out anything that smacked of uh, other than Christian. The shift in attitude towards Christianity was a direct response to Constantine's need to assert order in his empire. Following his victory at the Milvian Bridge, he had a vision of the sign of the cross and converted from paganism to Christianity to become the first Christian emperor and supreme pontiff. What he wanted was one God one emperor. Let's just have one Jesus, please, and let's stick to the story. In 325 AD, Constantine called together his bishops of the Roman Empire to form the Council of Nicaea. Their goal was to reach consensus. And they voted in that Jesus was equal to God, and that's where you got the beginning of what we call today the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ. What he wanted was unity, and they got unity when the, the majority agreed that the Father and the Son were co-equal. Once that happened, then they said anything else is heretical. Our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary. 
and was made man. If you don't agree with it, you'll be banished, and in the Roman world, that meant death. You were exiled beyond the borders of the empire, and that was it. So, you know, the, 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 the trail of deceit, deception, destruction of, of the evidence was actually quite a pious thing that they were trying to do. They were trying to hold the, the whole thing together around one particular story. And we believe one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sin. And we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. To maintain absolute order, any traces of mystical pagan ties to Christianity were destroyed. The pagan world was regarded as such a threat because everybody knew that this was the same. We have pagan commentators saying, hang on, this story that you're peddling as, as your Jesus Christ, son of God, this, these are our Dionysus mysteries. All of those people were put to death, they were exiled, books were burned, temples were torn down, crosses over everything. They tore down the ancient world. In this ancient pagan temple, the Serapium, in Alexandria, Egypt, members of the Serapis cult were forced to secretly worship statues of their gods and goddesses in dark tunnels deep beneath the earth. On the shelves of these caves laid religious texts, scrolls, and papyri of their cult, hidden away for safekeeping. The Christians allegedly burned the books which had been moved out of the library into the Serapeum, the sanctuary. They burned all the books there. You know, that was the greatest collection of, of human wisdom on the planet at the time. And the entire thing was put to the torch because it was considered heresy. An encyclical went out from Rome saying that all of these texts must be destroyed, the Gnostic Gospels. We're only going to have these four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All the rest are heretical. By 476 AD, the Roman Empire had fallen, but Orthodox Christianity flourished. Constantine's insistence on the literal Jesus Christ was the law. Some suspect that it was done deliberately as a kind of um, um, trick. Others um, believe it just happened because uh, it was easier. That the ordinary people were able to accept a literal view of stories that were very familiar. But even as late as the 5th century, Christians had to be told by the Pope to stop the practice of worshipping the sun on the front step of St. Peter's in Rome. Christliness was not something that just dawned in the year one uh, uh, of the coming era. Beneath the epicenter of Christianity, the Vatican, under St. Peter's Basilica, is a ceiling mosaic dating back to the third or fourth century that some believe clearly demonstrates the merging of pagan and Christian beliefs. There's a, a picture of Christ sitting in a chariot, sun god, with wings and everything. Right underneath St. Peter's Basilica itself, in fact, in the catacombs of Rome, there are many uh, wrapped figures of mummies which they can't tell are, are supposed to be baby Jesus or baby Horus. And um, in many cases, they have a sun disk right on them. But the idea that Christianity took its stories from Egyptian mythology is too far-fetched for most mainstream Christian scholars. The fact of the existence of Jesus is one of the surest historical facts uh, of anything in antiquity. 
The notion of Jesus Christ stemming from paganism is absurd, according to leading Christian theologians. They claim Harper is misreading Egyptian mythology and ignoring the evidence. Tom Harper is convinced of a link between the Egyptian pagan god Horus and Jesus Christ. His is not a literal view of Jesus, but a metaphorical one. I think he's made a mistake of buying in to uh, views that really no historians that I'm aware of would accept as really credible. Tom's book calls for a total re-examination of how Christianity got started. So I read it and said, uh, you know, does he make some good points? And um, I decided he didn't. While Tom Harper is not alone in his beliefs, some of the world's most respected religious scholars feel that his theory on the origins of Christianity is deeply flawed. They claim that no logical link can be made between ancient Egyptian beliefs and Christianity. There are a few gods that die and come back to life um, in some of the ancient religions, but there really isn't anything like that in Egyptian religion at all. A lot of this stuff is just absolutely made up, or the historical images really have no connection. Beyond sort of general parallels, they aren't specific kinds of parallels. Because they sound somewhat similar, they, they must be similar, and therefore Christianity derives from this. Well, the argument just simply uh, isn't there. It's not necessarily a coherent view of what Egyptian religion was. It's very complex, extends over thousands of years, and there isn't a sort of you know, way to find an actual summary of it. Within the walls of the old city of Jerusalem, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was built by Emperor Constantine over the site of a pagan temple. In 326 AD, he decreed that this was the exact location where Jesus Christ died and was later resurrected. Millions of Christian pilgrims accept his words as absolute fact. Christianity is hinged on the real Jesus Christ dying and being resurrected. And uh, I think the evidence is very, very clear. That's exactly what happened. Known as the holiest Christian site in the world, visitors mourn his death at the very spot they believe his body was washed by his disciples. For the millions who visit each year, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is absolute proof of the existence of Jesus Christ. The evidence is incontrovertible that Jesus existed historically. Jesus of Nazareth was a person who lived um, and walked the dusty roads of Palestine and was crucified on a Pontius Pilate. The rock formation beneath the church closely matches the description of the resurrection site in the New Testament. It is this kind of evidence that for some confirms the existence of Jesus Christ. You've got four Gospels that are independent witnesses. Um, all of them are written before the end of the first century. Um, that's not really debated uh, by scholars. No one really knows who wrote the Gospels, although they were attributed to disciples Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But they remain the heart of Christian theology. You have different gospel accounts, but they agree on the core of a uh, human being, Jesus Christ. And then there is external evidence in, for example, Roman historians and, and other places that uh, cite and accept that there was this, this figure. External evidence in the form of several passages of ancient historical text that refer to a Christ-like figure. But others aren't so sure and believe many of these texts are ambiguous or outright forgeries. The greatest suspicion is cast on the work of Flavius Josephus, a respected first century historian whose writings contain references to Jesus. The one passage in Josephus, which on the face of it, really does sound like a very strong piece of evidence for the existence of this man, because here's a Jewish historian who gives us some real interesting insights into this figure Jesus, until 
you critically analyze it and very quickly realize that it turns out to be a very, very crude forgery. Many scholars claim that in the 4th century, on orders from Constantine, the work of Josephus was reinterpreted to include those references to Jesus Christ. The man assumed to have altered the text was Bishop Eusebius, a powerful figure in Constantine's court. It was just a time of great fraud. All the history of that first important naissance of the church is told by the pet theologian of Constantine, Eusebius. And Eusebius makes no bones about the fact that he has made everything right for the church. I think that that really carries things a little bit far to say that that's a whole complete fabrication because there's no real need for it. But even in the, the testimony about Jesus, scholars have taken away what they think may have been later Christian interpolation. And the part they come up with is still a part that is substantial and substantial enough to include a reference, a historical reference to Jesus. Constantine's conversion and what that did for Christianity has been hugely important in the history and development of Christianity, but it certainly didn't do the kinds of things that some people have thought in terms of inventing things out of, out of whole cloth. Christianity has been sort of the institutional religion in much of the Western world for a long time, uh, for good or for bad. And there have been good things about that and there have been bad things about that. But it does set itself up then for being seen to be a player in a conspiracy theory, right? They're the people who control everything. They have been suppressing everything. And if we only knew, you know, we would be freed or liberated in some way. I'm not saying they necessarily schemed um, in an evil way. But they, they succumbed to the temptation uh, that was inevitable once people to have blind faith and, and come in in their masses and uh, depend on you for giving them salvation. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Can two billion Christians in the world be wrong? Certainly, that is true. I think of this, um, and I have to ask myself the question. Christianity does not encourage you to be credulous to just believe what you've been taught people should uh, should think critically about the faith whoever lives and believes in me shall never die do you believe this You know, you've seen them come in the park and like this, you know, because we see them during the day, and then they're like this, and then they're like this. They're watching through the different shows. At the Holy Land experience, the highlight of a day's visit is the staging of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. For many Christians, this miracle establishes their faith in everlasting life. And I love it when people get those moments, you can see in their eyes, they're like, I got it. And that to me is a miracle. You can't explain it. Uh, but there's faith in receiving. There's faith in believing. But for Tom Harper, that faith has been challenged. Is it possible then to remain a Christian? On the banks of the Jordan River, a tour group from Romania has come to be baptized as Christians. But the priest who will lead them in the ritual doesn't place much faith in these sacred waters alone. You won't find Jesus here at these holy places it, if you didn't find him before in your heart. It's, it's hard to express this. It's hard to express it. You must feel it. 
is the essence of, uh, of, of the faith, after all. For Tom Harper, this too is true, that Jesus Christ is within. That this Christian wisdom is no different than that of the pagans centuries earlier. They had a saying, the ancients, as above, so below. Whatever was in the heavens was within us. Tom Harper's conclusions shook the very foundations of his faith. But his acceptance of a pagan Christ has renewed his belief in the principles of Christianity. Well, the Gospels are really allegories of the struggle of the soul of every man, every woman. The Jesus figure stands for the higher self. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. In fact, the Gospels, seen in a new light, have brought him closer to his faith and given him a deeper understanding of their meaning. There's a mystery at the heart of Christianity, and that echoes the mystery religions which were all around and shows it a kinship between Christianity and them. What was the mystery? The mystery is this, not that you have to fall down on your knees and can beat your breast and say what a terrible, rabid sinner you have been for mercy at the mercy gate, which is the literalist point of view, but that within every one of us is the spark of the divine. Within every one of us are the seeds of our own salvation. We all share in this gift you have to awaken. You have to have a virgin birth. You have, the virgin birth is what happens inside you when you realize who you really are. <laughs>